Good afternoon, everybody, Your Excellencies, um, all protocols duly observed. My name is Felad Rotoye. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Visible Impact, and Visible Impact are the coordinators of the Project RAISE, Revive Academic Excellence in Our Schools and Educational Institutions. Um, we have a vision of seeing how we can get the private sector to collaborate. Um, in fact, let me say the civil society to collaborate together, even with the public sector, to see how how we can um, indeed take academic excellence back into our schools? How can we raise the standard of education back to where it was and probably even greater than where it was? Um, the, we have interesting facts that show that Nigeria at one point in time, close to the mid 70s, was one of the sixth highest quality standards of education in the world. Um, but we have uh, uh, come from that place to an, a, a place where, you know, there's. Whew, I would call it abysmal failure. 98% um, of anything is almost excellence in that thing. 98%. If you get 98% of anything, you're almost perfect in that thing. And so when 98.4% of the children that sit for our national examination uh, council exams, this is the NECO exams, when 98.4% of them fail, um, English, um, which is a basic communication subject for a nation that, that the official language is English, proper English, the constitution is written in en proper English, the national anthem is written in proper English, the pledge is written in proper English, the official correspondences are written in proper English. When 98% of those children cannot effectively pass that language barrier, um, you realize that you are raising a deficient generation. We have almost perfected the art of failure. In fact, put in another way, only 1.6% of very stubborn students refuse to fail. That's what 98.4% failure means. That is a great challenge that I must say is the responsibility not just of a government, but the responsibility of a generation. Now, it's been said several times that we may not be able to do anything about our past, but the future has no right to catch us by surprise. And that is why I'm so grateful that regardless of what we have seen and have been through, um, uh, we have the right to shape the future that we want. Uh, and, and, and so I would like to commend His Excellency, Ambassador Dozier Nwana, who I love and respect so much, sir. You know I do love and respect you. And um, all the other distinguished organizers of this incredible conference um, to put, that have pulled together the, the future by us. I, I think that it's such a critical conference for such a time as this. Um, back in 2001, um, we as a nation, Nigeria, were visited by uh, President Bill Clinton and he said something that was incredibly pertinent to where we are today. He said in the 21st century, the wealth of nations will not be measured by the, the value of the substance beneath their feet. It's not going to be the resources under the feet of its population that will matter. He said in the 21st century, it is going to be the value of the stuff between their ears. In other words, the resources between their ears that will matter. In other words, we're looking at a situation where it's not going to be natural resources as we have known it that will determine the value and the economy of Nigeria, especially in the nearest future, but it will be the intellectual resources, the human resources. Now, we've got to recognize that human resources, actually, it comes from two concepts. Number one is human capacity, and the other one is intellectual resource. It's only when you have human capacity, which is population, and intellectual resource that you come together and become what you call human resource. So it is possible to have a nation of 150 million human beings, and yet you do not have human resources. And yet you can have a nation of a smaller set of, of people or population and you have a high level of intellectual resource and that comes together and you have a very powerful nation with a very large and vast human resource or what you call human capital. Let me put it in another way. 
if 98.4% of a generation are failing the basic examination standard in English, in maths, if 75% of students that sit for, for physics exams in NECO fail, where are we going to get our scientists from? If 61% of the students that sit for biology fail and cannot make a credit, where are our doctors going to come from? Now, we need to understand something, and, and, and I hope that this is something that we're going to just take home with us, is that humankind was endowed by God with two principal um, instructions. Uh, number one was be fruitful. And from the perspective of progenition, that, that would be that we must have children. But the second most important law that it pertains to fathering or mothering or raising a generation was train up a child in the way that he should go, uh, particularly in a way that he will not depart from. Meaning that the generation that is ahead must always do what it can to train up a child. He didn't say train up your child. He said train up a child. Because we know one thing for sure, that no matter how well you can train your child, if you do not train up a child that may not belong to you, that one child will have the capacity to shape your future, especially in retirement. And so this is the place where we are, where we are raising a generation of children that may not have the capacity to earn a decent living. Why? Because very simple, the more you learn, the more you earn. And therefore, if you have students that cannot go beyond or pursue their academic dreams beyond their, their, their secondary school level, then you will have a generation of people who have no capacity to be able to earn what you might call a very decent income. Now, you know that this is what happens. The longer you live, the more life will charge you for the cost of living. So the more you grow, the greater your cost of living. Now, every time the cost of living exceeds your earning capacity, one of the things that happens is very simple. You will have only one of three options. Number one, you will have to either beg, borrow, or steal. Put in another interesting way. Since begging and borrowing will rely very much on the permission and uh, the compassion of the person that you are reaching out to, the one most likely to deliver results will be steal. I have not yet seen anybody tell me that they were robbed at gunpoint and they asked for a proposal from the thief as to what, whether, you know, somebody says, give me your phone. You say, well, can I see a proposal? No, 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 no. You call a thief, sir. Why? Because he has the capacity to change your life or end your life. We are sitting on a time bomb. If we do not fix education right now, there will be no future. Because the future has no capacity to earn, therefore they will have to either beg, borrow, or preferably steal. And this is the reason why I think it is so critical that the work that you're doing today in the city of London is so important. And I, and I do pray that it goes beyond what you call a conference and it starts a movement. A movement in the, in, in the right direction to, to revive academic excellence in our schools and educational institutions. Now, this is my own belief, very simply, that to be able to revive academic excellence, we're going to have to be looking at what I call the cobweb model of fixing education. As far as we are concerned,